Welcome, September. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's Old Home Week here at the Ford Presidential Museum, as you can see. We are really delighted to have all of you with us this afternoon. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of the library in Ann Arbor and the museum here in Grand Rapids. We're honored to have so many distinguished guests with us today to kick off our fall programming during this Ford centennial year. As many of you know, it's been a banner year of outstanding programs and events, and this program, I guarantee, will continue that tradition. As with most of our programs, this afternoon's presentation is made possible through the outstanding generosity of the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation, in addition to our ongoing support as a part of the National Archives and Records Administration. This afternoon's program is special in several ways. Not only is our speaker a trustee of the Ford Presidential Foundation, but he is also an alumnus of the Ford Administration, who has had a long and distinguished career in politics, business, and government service. The format for the program will begin with remarks by Secretary Rumsfeld, and then he will be pleased to take questions from the audience. When we get to that time, please raise your hand and Jim Kratzis, Deputy Director of the Museum, and Joe Calvaruso, Executive Director of the Ford Foundation, will pass a microphone to you. For those interested in Secretary Rumsfeld's newest book titled Rumsfeld's Rules, Leadership Lessons in Business, Politics, War, and Life, we have copies available in the museum store. And I have to say, it's wonderful. At this time, I'd ask that you please be sure that your cell phones are turned off and your pagers as well. And we would also ask that you not take photographs during the program. Now, to provide a very special and personal introduction of our speaker, it's my pleasure to welcome someone who is a notable leader in the West Michigan community, who is a longstanding member of the executive committee of the Ford Presidential Foundation, who is a great supporter of the Ford Library and Museum, and also is a former ambassador to Italy. And if you haven't figured it out, please, <laughs> please welcome our own Ambassador Secchia. Well, we have a lot of old friends here who knew Rummy when he used to live at Castle Park live in general terms. He'd stop by every summer for the wave to his friends. But uh, it was good to see Remy because I was there when he arrived as the transition chief to help President Ford get ready and then as he became chief of staff. So I watched him. I watched him. I loved him. I respected him. I stood behind him. I really believe he did the right things when he could. And uh, it was good to see him tonight because he's been wearing that same jacket since 74, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> and he used the first line he always uses. I thought Joan was going to introduce me, and now I've got to listen to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is the way it is with Rum. And, they, you know, what happens, so you all know how he and Cheney used to banter. And then you'd read what other people said they really said. Uh, I talk to Cheney regularly because his daughter now is a candidate for the U.S. Senate, and He's been checking in and talking about those issues, and here's Rum. Just uh, Don has finished this second book, and this is a very interesting book. And uh, not only I think there's some comparables in our career. I went to Michigan State. He went to Princeton. That's about it. Right? <laughs> uh, we got we got a Princeton guy in our neighborhood, and he flies a Michigan flag. I figured that one out. Uh, but there's a guy who's really confused. But. Uh, in our neighborhood, we have a lot of people who uh, are proud of what they've done. Nobody should be prouder than Don Rumsfeld. And his wife, Joyce, is here with him today. They're a wonderful couple. They stood for a lot of the same stoic reasons that Jerry Ford was so popular here. They're principled, they use reason, and they're steadfast in their beliefs. And I remind you, Don, before you get up here and take the mic after me, that one of your rules is talk sweet, because tomorrow you may have to eat the same words. <laughs> so, I, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce someone we can all be proud to have in Grand Rapids, Donald Rumsfeld. Well, you can see why I was hoping that Peter's wife, Joan, would introduce me. <laughs> 
You should stand up, Joan, so people can see you. <laughs> Elaine, Joe, thank you both for all you do for the Ford Museum and Library and the trustees and supporters and donors to this institution. I, I thank you for being here. I thank you for contributing to this worthwhile effort. Uh, it is... It is something that I think is important uh, for our history, and, and I thank you for doing that. Uh, Excellency, he loves that. <laughs> you, you know, that's what they call ambassadors, and some of us get over it. <laughs> Now, truth be told, why am I dressed like this? This is not my high school sport coat. I just came from Montana this morning, and uh, I forgot to bring a suit. It's just that simple. I must say, I think a lot of you look very nice. <laughs> and next time I come, I'll have a suit. And um, we, we actually, Joyce and I were out there for a couple of weeks in, in uh first in New Mexico for a couple of weeks and then up in Montana and uh, had an exciting time. We saw a bear come into the property and some folks were frightened and Joyce said it looked like Pooh Bear <laughs> and, and was kind of down and out and she just keeps hoping everything turns out right for that bear. And then I looked out the window of our place, and there's a dirt road, and we've got a little dachshund about this big named Wrigley, named for Wrigley Field. Uh, you know, hope springs eternal. Maybe, <laughs> maybe someday they'll win a game. But um, Wrigley was chasing a coyote. The coyote was half again as big and was on cruise control. You could see him just steady, long, beautiful strides. And our little dachshund's legs were going like a piston in a locomotive so fast. And I watched him go, must have been close to 100 yards, and then they disappeared into the brush. And all I could think of was, what if the coyote stopped and <laughs> turned around? It'd be all over for Wrigley. But fortunately, Wrigley came back with his tongue out. So we, we've been out west, and Joyce was born in Montana, and we try to spend time out there and have a good time. First of all, I, I thank all of you for being here. I'm, I'm delighted to have a chance to be back at the museum. And um, I, I was asked to talk a bit about Rumsfeld's rules. It, it fits that I'm here in the Ford Museum because, you know, my mother was a school teacher. And she told me when I was a youngster, I'd say, well, what's this word mean? And she'd say, write it down, go look it up in the dictionary, keep track of it. At the end of the week, read all those things. I still carry my three-by-five cards. My mom's been going a long time. <laughs> but I still carry them and write down words. And then pretty soon I'd start writing down thoughts or ideas or mistakes or things that worked out well. Uh, advice. I remember Joyce's father, before we got married, said to me one day, he said, you know, Don, if you're coasting, you're going downhill. And I wrote that down, and I thought about that. And uh, it's little things like that. And so I, one day I was in the, the president, I was, I almost said I was ambassador to NATO when President Ford became president. But, but <laughs> <laughs> I knew Peter would say, get over it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and I said something, some rule like that. And uh, President Ford said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's just something. I write these things down. And, and uh, he said, well, give them to me. I'd like to see them. I said, well, they're, they're all on cards in a file. And he said, uh, well, get, type them up. So I had, had them typed up, and I gave them to him. And he named them Rumsfeld's Rules, asked me to circulate them among the senior staff because it wasn't his staff. He was, as the only president who'd never been elected president or vice president, he was presiding over a White House that had been selected by his predecessor. And uh, he said, I think the senior staff ought to read those things, because there was a lot of 
advice from people an awful lot smarter than I am, goodness knows, and, and I'd kind of kept track of those things. And uh, after a while, someone in the press wrote something about them, and they kind of gained a life of their own. And, uh, and, and as I say, President Ford started calling them Rumsfeld's Rules, and, and uh, uh, people would ask for copies. And, and I decided, uh, oh, a year or two ago, to sit down and, and prepare a book about the, the rules. And uh, as I say, first of all, they're not all rules. Uh, they're observations or thoughts. And second, they're goodness knows they're not all Rumsfelds. They come from Sun Tzu or Winston Churchill or Mrs. Thatcher, who said, you know, the only trouble with socialism is that pretty soon you run out of other people's money. <laughs> uh, and and it, it, it's a lot of things like that that kind of uh, registered on me. And, and uh, so I've had a lot of fun collecting them and uh, putting them together. I, someone who counted them said there are over 380, I think, rules. The last one is, if you ever have rules, never have more than 10. <laughs> And uh, another one of the rules that Joyce's uh, father told me was, uh, he said, Don, what you want to do is always have six months' salary in the bank. No matter what you're making, have six months' salary in the bank. I said, why? He said, because then if anyone ever asks you to do something that you don't think is right and you don't think is honorable, and you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. And it's, it's not bad advice. Uh, the, um, you, you think about those things. Joyce's rule in there, one of them was, she said to me one day as I was going off to meet with the press, she said, Don, it's not good to have either infatuation or resentment of the press. They have their job, and you have yours. And they're different. And you know, that's not bad advice when you think about it. We've got some folks from the press back there, and we respect your job, and uh, thank you for being here. Now, I, um, I've thought about the opportunity of responding some, to some questions here. And I have found that it, if I talk, I don't learn anything. And I feel shorted. And I've come a long way from Twin Bridges, Montana, and I want to learn something. And if I a, a, a answer questions, I learn something because I know what, what people are interested in and what they're thinking about. And I find that helpful. So what I'd like to do is to stop there and, and respond to questions on any subject that uh, is of interest. Uh, I'll answer the questions I know the answers to, and I'll respond carefully to the ones I don't know the answers to. <laughs> and, and someone back there has already got his hand up, and that's what scares the dickens out of me. <laughs> you know, the, the, guy, the one that's eager has thought about it, probably even wrote it down, and it, it, it could be unpleasant. So I, re I, I reserve... I, I hope it won't be, Mr. Ross. I, I, re I reserve the right to smile. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you for coming uh, to Grand Rapids here. Uh, my question is, now that you've had the benefit of hindsight, would you still be in favor of the invasion of Iraq? And if so... What, in hindsight, would you have done differently or recommended to the president in terms of the occupation in Iraq? Well, I, th I suppose I would answer it by uh, saying that I think the president made the right decision. He was faced with a body of information and intelligence that was persuasive. He decided that it was the right thing to do. And, in fact, um, I would go so far as to say that Iraq is a better place today without Saddam Hussein than it was with him. He'd killed hundreds of thousands of people. Looking at the killing fields and the burial grounds that exist in that country were perfectly horrible places. 
he had tens and tens and tens of thousands in people and political prisoners. He'd used chemical weapons against his own people and uh, against his neighbors. He had been giving $25,000 to terrorist families who went out and killed innocent men, women, and children and uh, had been host to people like Zarqawi and others in his country. Today, the people have schools. Uh, they have a free press. Uh, they have a stock market. Uh, is it tidy and neat? No. Is it, uh, are people killed? Yes. Are people killed in Chicago? Yes. Uh, it, it is a, a tough part of the world. They've got deep sectarian differences. I sat down, um, and I've got a website called rumsfeld.com, uniquely. And, <laughs> And when I wrote my memoir, Known and Unknown, I put 4,244 documents, primary source documents, on the website. A lot of them relate to, to your question. And one of the documents there is what later became known as a parade of horribles. I sat down one day before the war, and, uh, and before the president had made a decision to go to war, I believe. I don't, I don't know precisely when he made it, but... He effectively made it when he signed the order, um, after having gone to Congress, after having gone to the UN. Um, but he, uh, th this memo I wrote were all the things that could go bad uh, if he did decide to go to war. And um, there were a whole series of things. You could end up with Israel engaging in the war and causing a, a broader conflict. You could end up with Saddam Hussein uh, doing what he did when he invaded Kuwait and, and blowing up a lot of oil wells. You could end up with, with a sectarian conflict within the country. You could end up not finding weapons of mass destruction. I listed about 20 or 30 things and sent the memo to the president, the vice president, and the members of the National Security Council. It, at the very end, I, I said someone could also write a memo like this. Uh, what could go wrong if you don't go in? if you don't do it. And I didn't do that, but I probably should have. And if you go to my website, uh, you'll, you can read the memo and see that war is a terrible thing. It is clearly a last resort. Saddam Hussein had rebuffed 17 UN resolutions. And um, it, it is uncertain, to be sure. But, um, you know, uh, it, it is... The, the major combat operations were, were handled with dispatch. The insurgency that grew up afterwards and continued and to some extent continues throughout the region uh, is, is a difficult thing. The Sunni-Shia divide is a problem in, in the world. That uh, It's going to affect not just the Middle East, but, but all of us eventually in one way or another. The... Um, Radical Islamists that exist in the world, not as a majority in the Muslim faith, but as a non-trivial minority, are determined. And, and they, they have uh, radical imams and madrasas around the world that teach people not how to get jobs or not how to learn something, but how to go out and kill innocent men, women, and children. And they are... A lot of people in the world, Muslims and others, are fearful of them because they're violent and they kill people and they intimidate and intimidation can work. And so you have a, a problem of that being a outsized segment, not by numbers but by effectiveness. And uh, they are able to recruit and raise money and train people uh, for terrorist acts. The uh, I guess the, the, the shorter answer to your question is you think about the, the decisions the president is faced with today. They're tough decisions. Those are All the easy decisions get made down below. And then it ends up on the Oval Office. And President Obama is faced with some terribly difficult decisions. And, uh, and President Bush was. And President Ford was. And it's the nature of it. And... and 
it is an, it's uncertain when they make those decisions. There, there are things, as I say, in the parade of horribles that can go one way. Fortunately, a lot of them didn't happen. A lot of the terrible things that could have happened didn't. Uh, some things that were terrible, in fact, did happen. But uh, it's, it's kind of uh, watching the process in the White House today, uh, having been there and served there for, I guess, four or five different presidents. Um, it is, uh, I, I think of Sec Secretary Kerry coming into that job and have a sense that he was dealt a tough hand. My, personally, I think that. He, the, the decisions that were made in the preceding four years leading up to today in there put him in a, in a very, very tough position. Uh, and, and the problem is you deal with the world like you find it. Uh, it isn't the way you would like it. Joe. Uh, yes, sir. I, I also would like to thank you for coming to Michigan. We, we appreciate uh, the information you're sharing with us. Uh, you've obviously had a, just a wealth of experience uh, at all levels of government. I'm interested, sir, you, you've been called upon to provide international advice in the past. and You were just referring to the dilemma that uh, President Obama is currently facing and the Congress is currently facing. If you were called upon to provide advice regarding that scenario, what would that advice be? Was there a question over here? <laughs> well, I'm glad I don't have to give advice, to be honest with you. I think it's, um, as I say, the, the steps that have been taken previously, I think, have been in a number of instances unfortunate. There's no question but that a lot of people in that part of the world today believe that we put our, I guess this shows how old I am, uh, I was going to say we put our thumb on the scale like the old butcher used to do in, in Egypt and favored the Muslim Brotherhood. And the people who don't favor the radical Islamists uh, have turned away from us because of that. And the situation he faces in Syria is, is not simple. There are people who believe very sincerely that, that we should be helping the, uh, the rebels who are opposing Assad. Uh, I look at it and it's, I see a spectrum of people. I see Al-Qaeda types and, and uh, the radical Islamists on one part, Muslim Brotherhood types, who are well organized, dedicated, uh, brutal, tough and uh, determined and pretty well financed. And then you feel you see a lot of nice people who are, have good intentions and would like better jobs and are tired of an Assad dictatorship and the brutality of it, who don't like the idea of using uh, chemical weapons on their own people. And uh, you wonder if you help, how, what, what will be the outcome? Can you really help? Can you, can you affect it? And I guess I'm kind of at a point where I think well, let me let me take a moment on this and I was speaking at, at Leavenworth uh, to I think fourteen hundred and ninety some odd majors uh, from various countries, including ours, a lot from our country. And the last question was, what do you worry about the most? And, you know, the things that pop in your mind, you think of cyber warfare and, and how dependent we are on digits as, as a people. The most more advanced countries, obviously, are the most vulnerable countries to cyber attacks. We've thrown away our three-by-five card boxes. And, uh, the, uh, and, and you think of terrorism and you think of nuclear weapons. And, and actually what I answered was, was different. I said what worries me the most is that throughout my adult life, the United States of America, following Great Britain, has contributed to a more stable and peaceful world. And that, that has been a force for generally for good in the world. And that we are at a period where that is in decline. I, I, I don't think you can manage your economy, uh, modeling it on Europe, and not send a signal out of weakness 
that's a failed model. It doesn't work, and what we're doing isn't working. And the world knows it isn't working, and they expect us to be less capable, less involved. They I talked, to, talked about the defense budget and, and I think took out a half a trillion dollars uh, and then over a 10-year period and then agreed to take out uh, uh, under the sequestration another half a trillion, which sends out a signal to the world that the United States is not only going to be in decline from an economic standpoint, but is going to be in decline from a military standpoint. When I went to Washington out of the Navy in 1957, we were spending 10% of our gross domestic product on defense. Today, we're spending less than 4% on defense. This was during the Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson period, 10% of GDP. The debt, the deficits, are coming not from the defense budget. They're coming from entitlements. It's just, I mean, as Willie Sutton said, they said, why did you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And, and people are saying, well, we ought to take it out of defense. And I don't know. Our friends in Europe, the other like-thinking countries in the, in the world, are spending less than 2% of GDP on defense. Now, what does is, what is that signal of weakness mean? It means that we're creating a vacuum out in the world. And that vacuum is being filled by people who don't have our values, don't have our interests, and are behaving in ways fundamentally different than they would behave if they sense that the United States was going to continue to be a significant factor in the world for peace and for stability. And for now, what does all that mean? It, it, it means to me, you, you go to Syria, let's take it down to a specific case. You know, you begin by saying you, you always, I, I would always tend to be favorable to a president's proposal in, in this area. The debate about whether or not the president has the authority to do, to use force is, is silly. I mean, we've gone through, when was the last time war was declared? It was World War II. We've used force how many times? Why? Because the commander in chief, you can't have 535 members of Congress making decisions that a commander in chief needs to make. You just can't do it. It doesn't work. Now, what does all that mean? Uh, I, I have to say that I, the idea that the president would, would play cards or go to Las Vegas during Benghazi or that he would go play golf during this decision with respect to Syria, having described it, having had his secretary of state describe it with the forcefulness and thoughtfulness, I will say, that Secretary Kerry presented to the country. Uh, I don't know how many people heard his, his remarks, but I thought they were compelling and, and persuasive. And, and the president is not, in my view, providing the kind of leadership that I think almost any president in my adult lifetime would be providing. I mean, I, I can say for a fact I... I think of Gerald Ford and how he would be dealing with an issue like this, and it would be notably different. And I think that the essence of of leadership is is believability and uh, having a vision and the ambivalence about what it is we might do in Syria. I, I'm at the point where if if someone walking down the street and, or in an elevator said, what do you think? I would say immediately, you either ought to change the regime or you ought to do nothing. Why would you go in and fire a shot across the bow? All it does is make a splash. <laughs> what have you achieved? Well, what you've probably achieved, if you are, uh, approach it from a minimalist standpoint, what you've probably achieved is the embarrassment of the United States for being feckless and ineffective. And, and given the, what's going on in Iran, the, the, the last thing we ought to be sending out is a signal that there was a red line and, and we fired a shot across the bow. Or not to worry, it'll be minimalist, or whatever, all the things, I don't want to even quote them because I, 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 it's embarrassing. Um, 
You have to have a vision. You have to know what you're going to do, and and you have to provide the kind of leadership a commander in chief would provide. And to suggest that it's really not going to be much, and it might last six, eight, ten, twelve hours, maybe twenty-four, and and that it's not regime change, and not to worry. Then why do anything? All you do is look ineffective. So I guess my advice was, if if you decide that it's in our national interest to do anything, it's to change the regime. I mean, Assad was described by Secretary of State Clinton as a reformer. I never dealt with him. I dealt with his father. And uh, they're a tough crowd. I mean, his father killed uh, 10,000, 20,000 people at Hama on a weekend because he didn't like them. They were... They were against the Alawite power in, in the country. Um, I, I am dis, of, of a view that it is not good for the United States to look feckless or ineffective. And if we decide as a nation to do something, I, I think we ought to go do it and change the regime or we ought not to do anything is kind of where I am, uh, which is... Um, you know what no one's even saying is the UN can't do a lick. This, the people talk about the international community as, those are, as though there is an international community. There isn't an international community. It's not a community at all. The, it, 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 If you say that you can't do anything until the UN agrees to it, what you're saying is, we won't do anything unless Mr. Putin and the PRC agree to it, because they've got a veto, and they've said it. But nobody is pinning the tail on the donkey. Nobody is saying that they've just killed something in excess of a thousand with chemical weapons, according to Secretary Kerry. And the Chinese and, and the Russians are supporting the use of chemical weapons. That is what's happening by their public opposition in the United Nations to the United Nations expressing anything. And no one's saying that, that they've positioned themselves in favor of chemical weapons. We didn't come to talk about Syria. What else? <laughs> Why don't you retract that question? <laughs> yes. I need a mic. Oh, here's one. I should go where the mic is. Excuse me. Uh, real, real quickly, I, I, noting where you're standing, I won't ask you who the best leader is that you served under, uh, but I do want to, you started to touch on it. I, I'm looking for what are those characteristics that you have experienced in a good leader? And, and what are those lessons that uh, those of us that are on the younger side are hoping to become leaders? Everyone's uh, on the younger side these yeah. days. <laughs> I've lived one third of the history of our country. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to your insight as to the best leaders that you've served under and served with and what you've led uh, yourself with and what are sort of those mantras that, uh, that we need to look for in good leadership. Well, obviously, you're a leader, and God bless you. Thanks for what you do for the country. Um, I, um, it, it, when someone uses the word leader, what pops to my mind is Anwar Sadat. Now, why would anyone say that? Here was a fellow who I went to Nasser's funeral uh, representing the United States. And here was this vice president who was acting president. I think it was 1970 or 71. And uh, we spent time with Sadat. And the, I was with uh, the fellow who wrote the book, uh, Diplomat Among Warriors, named Robert Murphy, who was a very distinguished State Department official, and John McCloy, who had been High Commissioner of Germany and Assistant Secretary of War. We were the U.S. representatives, and we came out of the meeting with Sadat, and we'd been told that he, that uh, Nasser wanted weak vice presidents. He didn't want someone replacing him. So, so Sadat was kind of a cipher. He wasn't going to last very long, and of course that intelligence was not too intelligence. It turned, <laughs> turned out to be wrong. Uh, I, I suppose... You know, one of the things in the book, Rumsfeld's Rules, is if it's intelligence, it's not a fact. If it were a fact, it would not be intelligence. 
So we ought to always remember that when we think of intelligence. But, but Sadat really was impressive. Um, to imagine what he did. When we landed in that place, there were Soviet tanks, airplanes, and soldiers all over the place in Egypt, in Cairo. Within a matter of months, he kicked the Soviets out. He went to Israel, established a treaty with Israel that, that anchored a reasonable period of stability for some decades in that part of the world, which now is in great jeopardy. Um, courage. Man, I mean, I he was killed by the Muslim Brotherhood offshoot. But he had courage, and he had vision. Um, I, I think uh, leadership, you know, in our country, we don't lead by command, even in the Pentagon. You, you lead by persuasion. You lead by consent. And consent requires persuasion, and persuasion requires believability. So you, you have to be trusted to be believed, and, and you can't lead unless you can persuade, and you can't persuade unless you're seen as trustworthy. So a critical aspect of leadership is that. Uh, but it's also courage. It's also the kind of courage that Sadat. Um, you lead by words to be sure, but you also lead by example. And um, my, my uncle was a professor of speech. Unfortunately, he died before I ever went into politics, so I never got the benefit of him. But, but he used to say that persuasion a, is, is a two-edged sword, reason and emotion. Reason, because you need something that sustains an effort, but emotion, because it gets you going, and, and, and leadership requires the ability of getting people going. It's a, it's a two-edged sword, reason and emotion, plunge you deep, he would say. But I, um, I think that, that the... When you think of Gerald Ford, he didn't lead as much by words as he did by example. Uh, he, he, he was the one president that I worked with who was a personal friend from our time in the Congress, and I'd helped manage his campaign for conference chairman in 1962 before I was ever even sworn in. Uh, Bob Griffin came to me and talked me into recruiting freshman congressmen to vote for this friend of his, Gerald Ford, who was running for the conference chairmanship of the Republican Party. And two years later, we finally talked Gerald Ford into running for minority leader. Uh, and three of us, Bob Griffin and, and uh, Charlie Goodell and I, uh, worked on his campaign, and he won by a handful of votes. But, but his leadership quality was that every person who knew him or listened to him could just feel the basic human decency in that man, that he was at, 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 at his core and center a thoroughly honorable, fine public servant, a, a man who cared deeply about the country, who was a patriot, and, and who was very comfortable listening to others and, and having competing ideas in a room and then coming to his decision. Uh, I, I think that... that Believability probably is is central to the leadership question, and I, I would add courage of a, of a Sadat nature. Question: Who's got the mic? I guess. Oh, Joe, you're just sitting over there holding it. <laughs> What's going on around here? This, by just the way, don't this, give it to Sekia. Uh, this will be the last question. Uh, time is flying by. Oh this, no! I've answered too long. Let's take two or three. And this more. is the uh, we can do the it. honorable Winky. We won't make that the last one. We'll get over here with this one. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. I'm taking over the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll Thank try you. to answer more briefly. My question is not as good as Congressman Heising does, but he's been in politics a lot longer than uh, most of us have. But uh, uh, my question is. Americans seem to be universally hated in the in the Middle East in the Muslim world, and mm -hmm. for the life of me, I don't know why that is. I never read a good explanation of it. Uh, could you tell us your thoughts on that? Uh, I, th I think of our support of Israel. Does that do it? Uh, 
Uh, I don't think that you would uh, vacation in Baghdad uh, versus Montana anytime soon. Uh, and I doubt you've ever gotten a thank you note from the people of Iraq. But uh, why is it that they simply all seem to despise our efforts that we think are well-natured, uh, well-meaning to, uh, to help them? Yeah. What is the reason for that? Thank you. Well, let me uh, say this about that. That, that, that is a, an important question. And it is, it, it is, I promise to give short answers, and I'm now going to reject my promise. <laughs> First of all, I don't believe it. It isn't true. I have two titanium hips and a titanium shoulder, he said, um, bragging. Kind of disappointed, I told the doctor I wanted all new body parts, but he said no. So I had a, a therapist come, and he was from Lagos, Nigeria. And he came to the house three days and showed me what to do to get my hips working right and, and get back playing squash. And, and uh, he was leaving, and I said, that's good enough. I'm disciplined. I can learn the exercises, and I'll do them religiously. And, and that's, I thank you. Thanks for helping out. He got to the door, he said, excuse me, Mr. Rumsfeld, can I say something personal? I said, sure. He said, you know, he said, I don't think Americans really appreciate their country. Uh, he came from Nigeria, and he said to me, you can go at 10 or 11 at night, almost any place in the world, and you'll see people sleeping out on the grass in front of a U.S. embassy wanting to be first in line to come to this country. Now, Bill Bennett was Secretary of Education for President Reagan. He, he, used to, he, he said, if you want to know what's really going on, give it the gate test. You lift up the gate and see which way things are moving. <laughs> and they're coming here. Why are they lined up to come here? Because this is a great country. It's a country of opportunity. And people... What do, they, what do they know of our country, really? They look at our movies and they look, look at the music and, and, you know, maybe I'm just an old fogey, but by golly, it doesn't represent our country. And, and yet, why are they lined up to come here? Because this is a land of opportunity. It is an amazing place. And they know it around the world. Now, why do people criticize us? Well, you, you, you want to blame somebody. If you want to learn how to blame, watch our president. <laughs> uh, just one time you'd like to see him suck it up and take responsibility for something. But, but the... the, the, the I, I, I remember I lived in Brussels when, as I mentioned earlier, I was U.S. ambassador to NATO. How's that, Pete? <laughs> I remember a Belgian coming to me, and he said, my granddaughter is pregnant. I'm sending her to the United States to have her baby there so that the baby will have the choice of dual citizenship because that's such an amazing country. I just want that. That's the nicest thing I can do for a grandchild. Now, people like to pick on the big guy. We are the big guy. We as a country, we have the most powerful military. We have the, the uh, biggest economy in the world for years and years now. We, we have influence and heft. Are we perfect? No. Do we make mistakes? You bet. Everybody makes mistakes. But, but no, why would anyone spend their time picking on Fijians? <laughs> they want to go after the big guy, and they do. And they want to, I rem, when I was President Reagan's Middle East envoy, by gosh, I sent back a memo and I said, I said, we've got to shift the gears here. Everyone wants to blame us for everything. And they do, why not? They've got to blame somebody. That's, if they don't want to take responsibility, they want to blame somebody. So they fuss at the United States because we're worth fussing at. Now, is it ever going to change? Sure. If we go into decline and we withdraw, people will like us. Big deal. They won't respect us, 
And we won't have the ability to contribute to a more peaceful and stable world. But I think when you, when you are the biggest and, and the most visible and imperfect as we are, I mean, goodness knows we're, we're going to make mistakes, um, then people are going to target us and pick on us and fuss at us and blame us. And, and what we need to do is to, that comes with the territory. Does it mean we're bad? No. Does it mean they don't want us around helping? No. I mean, when there's a humanitarian problem, how does it get solved? What happens when the tsunami in Japan or in, in uh, Indonesia? What happens with the earthquakes in Guatemala or in Pakistan? The United States of America steps up and helps people, and they see it. Osama bin Laden in Pakistan was popular way up here. And after the earthquakes, the United States went in there and the most popular toy was a, a miniature Chinook helicopter. And Osama bin Laden's popularity was down in the tank. So I, I guess my answer is, live with it. <laughs> you know, one of the Rumsfeld's rules, if you do something, somebody's not going to like it. So what's your choice? Don't do anything. Who wants to live a life like that? Nobody. So it seems to me that what we ought to do is, is accept our role, uh, do it with humanity and humility, understand that people are going to criticize and fuss and blame. But by golly, who do you want filling that vacuum? Russia? China? Who? Is there any country on the face of the earth? I mean, people fuss about North Korea. Picture the, North Korea, the, the Korean Peninsula, divided in half. Lousy war, tough war. Same resources, north and south. Same people, north and south. In the south, they've, they've, uh, from nowhere, they're the 12th largest economy on the face of the earth. And in the north, they're starving. They're taking people in the military under five feet tall because their, their, their growth has, has been stunted because of the lack of food. It's a tragedy what's going on in North Korea. Same people, same resources, same opportunities. This is an amazing country. And we aren't perfect but we have a role to play in the world. And if we don't fill that vacuum, people are going to fill it who don't have our values and, and don't have our interests, and it's going to be a considerably more dangerous world. And the biggest problem we face and what we ought to worry about when we go to sleep at night is we do not want to see this country in decline, despite the fact that people fuss at us. Yes? No, if in your opinion, uh, the Pakistani government or, and or military knew the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden for a while before we did and didn't communicate it. One of Rumsfeld's rules is when you don't know, you say you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> However, <laughs> I don't think they did. That's worth what you paid for it. <laughs> Why do I say that? I sat in the Pentagon for years. And you know the Potomac River runs right by the Pentagon and up there and all those big fancy houses go up uh, on both sides of the Potomac. They've got big nice houses and all kinds of gates and fences around them and big trees and, and then black limousines go in and out of those houses. I don't have any idea who's in there. None. He could have been there for all I knew. <laughs> I'll tell you something. If I were Osama bin Laden and I knew everyone in the world was looking for me, the last thing I would have done is tell anybody. And I don't think he did. I think he had a couple of people who would go in and out and bring him what he needed. And, and I, I mean, people said, oh my goodness, 
the uh, Pakistani military was just a, a mile or two away. Uh, they're one of their military bases. They must have known. They had to know. I don't think so. Look how long the FBI chases the 10 most wanted. In our country, it goes on and on and on. They look for them and they can't find them. I, 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 for, I mean, I just uh, would, if I had to put some money down, a little bit of money, I would say, I would guess they didn't know. And if they had known, you know, keeping a secret is, of course, all you have to do is look at the leaks in the government today, and I don't even need to tell you that keeping a secret's hard. It is very, very hard. And it's particularly hard uh, when, when something is as dear and precious as that piece of knowledge. Where is Osama bin Laden? Think of that. And, and it, it gives people a lot of incentive to go figure that out and talk to people. And it, some people like to tell people how much they know. They kind of strut around and tell secrets and put people's lives at risk and call up the New York Times and <laughs> tell them stuff they shouldn't know. And, and, uh, but uh, it's hard to keep a secret. So if you want to keep a secret, you better tell next to nobody. And my guess is that's what Osama bin Laden did that he had maybe one or two people who moved in and out and around, and I'll bet you the Pakistani army did not know. Huh. Yes, sir. Whoops. Joe, Joe's trying to give me the hook. I can feel it. You can speak as long as you want. It's 5 o'clock. Thank you for being here. Uh, is it possible for any nation to use chemical weapons resulting in the deaths of hundreds or thousands of women and children without creating a U.S. interest? That's yes or no. <laughs> Look, you ask him, I'll answer him. That good looking lady ever sit next to you like <laughs> fellow like you. My goodness. Um, they estimate that a hundred thousand people have been killed in Syria in the last two years. Over a hundred thousand. I was walking my dog past uh, around the corner where the Syrian embassy is, and a guy came running out to say hello to me from the Syrian embassy, and I looked at him and I said, I said, my heart just breaks for what's happening to the people in your country. And uh, I said, you know, 70, 80,000 people dead. I said, it's just a terrible tragedy. And he said, it's over 100,000. And he said something like 12 or 15 of his own extended family had been killed. And he serves in the Syrian embassy. And, he, and then he said, looked me in the eye, and he said, all because of one man, meaning Assad. No. I, there, 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 there ought to, There is a difference between chemical weapons or nuclear weapons or biological weapons and regular weapons. But if you're dead, you're dead. And there's over 100,000 Syrians dead. Now, there are a, a, a big chunk dead because of chemical weapons. And my personal view is what I said earlier. I think that I think that the world ought to be concerned about a regime that does that. And the world isn't concerned. And the question is, do, what do we want to do as a country about it? O o o ought there to be a difference in behavior if thousands, a few thousand are killed, or hundreds, are killed with chemical weapons, and a hundred plus thousand are killed with regular weapons. Well, who is doing it? Sec Secretary Kerry says it's the Assad regime. I, I, I believe him. Uh, what ought to be done about it? 
I, I must say, this idea that we should, quote, um, do something but not much. That we should not worry, we won't do regime change. Um, it, it'll be short and brief and light, uh, but we want to fire a shot across the bow. And, and, and then he goes off and plays golf. I, I worry about... If, 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 if you had young men and women in your family in uniform whose lives could be put at risk, you want clarity. You want a vision. You want a, it, whatever it is you're going to do on behalf of the country to be worth doing. And in my view, firing a shot across the bow isn't worth doing. That either you ought to go in and change the regime or you ought not to do anything and, and just be a part of the so-called international community and, and, and uh, allow that to happen, which I think is, is truly unfortunate. The, the big issues in that part of the world, to be sure chemical we weapons are a big issue, but Egypt's the big issue. Iran is the big issue. That's where the heft is. That's where the, 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 the either the proliferation dangers will come from in Iran or the stability will or will not come from in Egypt. And um, our behavior, the United States, because of our history, when we do something somewhere in the world, it's noticed. And people behave off of our actions, our behavior, our conduct. And from what's been defined or described uh, in, in vague ways that's evolved, really, um, the signal being sent to Iran is not to worry. Go right ahead with your nuclear programs. And that's dangerous, I think. So I, I, think, uh, I think that they've got some very tough decisions, and goodness knows whatever the president decides, we want to be supportive and, and hopeful. And uh, to the extent American men and women in uniform are involved, you want to, as you always do, wish him Godspeed. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. On behalf of Elaine Didier, the director of the museum and library and the foundation, we appreciate the support we've had this year uh, from the local community, our trustees, and people like Secretary Rumsfeld willing to come back and talk about uh, issues as the presidency with President Ford, Ambassador Secchia, as well as all our trustees. Uh, his wonderful book is for sale out there at the, uh, the gift shop. Feel free to uh, shop around and uh, have a good evening. And on behalf of the uh, museum, they have put together memorabilia from Grand Rapids. And on behalf of the foundation, I'd like to present you with a gift and token of our appreciation. So thanks, everyone, for coming.